Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So I've got a treat for you today. We are looking at a medieval crossbow replica by Todd of Todd Stuff. Now, uh, before I start talking specifically about the crossbow, oh, it's quite a heavy thing, um, let's talk a little bit about um, Todd. So Todd's most famous for making daggers and crossbows, I would say. He makes all sorts of stuff, um, hence the name of his company, Todd Stuff. Um, but I would say, from my perspective, he is most well known for making knives and daggers on one hand, and in more recent times, I think, um, crossbows. And he's really got quite a reputation for making these crossbows. And one of the things is that there are a number of companies out there making replica medieval style crossbows. Um, but a lot of them aren't that authentic, and there's one particular reason why, which I'll explain in a second. Whereas Todd um, is making things much more closely based on the originals. I'm not saying he's the only one out there doing that, but um, certainly he's probably the best known person um, for making crossbows. Now, this particular crossbow, before I start to look at some details of it, is actually in the series Wolf Hall, um, and this was Damien Lewis's crossbow in that um, in that program in that series. So you can actually see this on screen um, being used. Um, but it is modelled on an original, the original which was owned by Emperor Maximilian, and is from the end of the 15th century. So this is a late 15th century, early 16th century style of crossbow. You can probably find similar ones going back to about the middle of the 15th century. And the main characteristics of it are that it is a spanned with a goat's foot lever, which is one of these, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, there are several ways of loading crossbows, I'll talk about that in a minute as well. Um, <coughs> and it has a steel bow. Um, the draw weight of this is around 380 pounds, which for anyone who does archery sounds like a hugely powerful load. But actually it's not that powerful. This is actually a relatively light crossbow in terms of medieval crossbows. Um, and an important factor here, and this now comes around to why Todd's bows are somewhat more historically accurate than a lot of them out there, is um, what we call power stroke, or what would essentially be with a bow, with a long bow or recurve bow, would be draw length. Now, when the bow is at rest, and bear in mind that it stays strong at all times, that's one of the uh, features of crossbows is that the, the bows themselves, or prod as they're some kind of, sometimes called, but I'm going to call it a bow because I think that's more historically valid for the period that we're talking about. Um, the bow is so stiff um, and so um, uh, essentially difficult to string that pretty much the bow has to remain strong uh, when at rest. <clears throat> um, now, the nature of the materials that the bow is made of allow that to be the case without detriment pretty much without detriment to the bow itself. There are two main types of bow that you find on medieval crossbows. There are steel bows, like this one. So this one has been covered with, I believe it's some kind of uh, probably linen, uh, and then painted, as you can see on the front there. Um, so there are steel bows, and then there are organic bows, as I'll call them. Now the organic bows are constructed usually of a combination of wood and horn, and sometimes sinew. Um, and um, the, the three of those materials, and they're not always all three I think are used, but usually um, wood, horn and sinew are used together, just as in an Asiatic or Middle Eastern um, recurve bow, for example, like a Mongol bow or a Persian bow or a, a, a Mamluk bow or a Turkish bow. Um, and they're made in a composite. And the, essentially the sinew does stretching, the uh, horn does compressing, and the wood sits in the middle. Um, now, uh, Todd, um, I believe, can make um, fully organic bows, but they're hugely more time-consuming uh, to make, and so most modern makers use steel bows. Now, an interesting feature, I had always wondered this, and I asked Todd when he was here dropping this over, and this is not for me to keep, of course, this is actually for sale on his um, website, linked below, and um, this is it in stock at the moment. Um, and I asked him about steel bows because I'd always wondered, I knew that in India they make um, actual recurve bows, or they used to make recurve bows of steel as well as the traditional organic type. And um, I had always wondered, you know, why, why do both exist? Um, does one have an advantage over the other? Is one harder to make? This kind of thing. And it, it seems to me the jury is out slightly, but steel bows are less efficient than organic bows. Um, but their organic bows are less, uh, they're more prone to, to damp, they're more prone to damage, 
um, they're perhaps more fragile and potentially, although maybe not in period, but in modern times, they take, it takes hugely longer to make an organic bow, so wood, sinew, horn, than it does to make a steel bow because of course these days we have access to good quality spring steel. Um, we make it into the right shape and heat treat it and bam, there you go, you've got a bow, nice and easy. Um, whereas to make a horn and wood and sinew bow is really, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's pr practically experimental archaeology. I'm sure there's some hidden elements or uh, forgotten elements to the science of, of doing it well. Um, but if you do invest a huge amount of time, what you get is a more efficient bow out of it. That is, when the bow string is, or um, yeah, when the string is drawn back and released, um, you get essentially quicker acceleration out of that string. The, the bow returns to its resting position more quickly with an organic bow than it does with a steel bow. Um, so in the modern world, it's easier to make a steel bow, but an, in theory, an organic bow would shoot a, a bolt or an arrow more quickly. Um, it would be more efficient. Now, in historical periods, the, the ease of manufacture of a steel bow for us doesn't necessarily relate to historical periods because, of course, their access to the top quality spring steel wasn't as reliable as ours is. Um, it was a far more involved and, and unpredictable process in the medieval period in Europe and indeed in, even in the 19th century in India when they were making the steel recurve bows. Um, so it, the jury's out slightly on why some bows had steel bows and why some crossbows had steel bows and why some crossbows had organic bows in the 15th century for example. It does seem that as you get later into the 16th century and when uh, crossbows were used for sporting purposes still in the 17th century and sometimes occasionally in war, um, they pretty much always had steel bows and I would guess, and this is only a guess because it's not a subject I've researched, I I'm sure there's a master's or a PhD in it uh, for someone out there, um, but my guess would be that in the 17th century large quantities of high quality spring steel was available, high carbon steel that could be made into a spring was available and so making steel bows was far more easy than making organic bows. Um, so despite the fact that they might not be as efficient as an organic bow, um, they uh, are, if you can churn out more of them then clearly that's probably what people are going to do. Now I've spoken enough about that specific topic, now draw length, so coming back to that one of the reasons why Todd's crossbows are more authentic than a lot of the medieval style crossbows that you'll find out there is that if you look at a modern crossbow and you look at a medieval crossbow, the draw length or power stroke is far shorter on a medieval bow. Now, again, we don't know the precise reason for that. You could make this bow shoot faster and further if you drew it back, if the trigger mechanism was further back on the stock and you drew it back further. Um, however, the power stroke is only about six inches on these historical medieval bows, whereas on modern crossbows for hunting, um, and obviously compound crossbows are a whole different kettle of fish, but even recurve modern crossbows using a, a um, fiberglass um, uh, or carbon fibre prod or, or bow, they tend to draw back a lot further, like 10, 12 inches. Now, energy, okay, this is where we come to physics, so I'm not going to pretend to be your school physics teacher. Um, but quite simply, if, you ha if this bow is of, cer of a certain um, uh, rigidity, should we say, we're fighting against it to draw it back. Now the further we draw it back, um, the longer the power stroke's going to be. Okay? And when we release that bow, in other words it's like drawing a, a longbow arrow back further, the further we draw it back, the more energy is going to be put into that arrow or bolt um, upon release. So therefore, if we drew this bow back an extra two inches, we would get a lot more power or energy, um, a lot more joules of energy into the projectile that it's shooting. However, for various reasons, uh, that some of which we can only guess at, medieval crossbows are usually only have a power stroke of around six inches. Now I haven't done, I know this is something Todd has researched, I have not. Um, so I'm saying six inches as a very approximate measure. Um, in actual fact, um, there's a variation I know, they probably vary from, you know, say five to seven inches or it might even be more than that, I don't know. Um, but around six inches, a six inch um, power stroke or draw length is historically accurate. And a lot of modern recreations being made, and I know some people who have some that look like medieval bows, 
are drawn back further, more like a modern crossbow, and that's not historically accurate. Now, <clears throat> what difference, uh, well, one, incidentally, just mention one reason why possibly they did that was um, for safety. So when you've got less predictable steel, so earlier world um, steel, so not modern carbon steel, where you know exactly what's in it and exactly what's gonna happen when you, when you heat treat it in a certain way, where you have more unpredictable steel or where you have an organic bow, drawing it back further might just mean that the risk of breaking the bow is too great. Okay, so it's not worth the trade-off. So it's in that case better to make the bow more rigid or more powerful and have the keep the draw length at only six inches. Um, so that's the probable reason why they had shorter power strokes on medieval bows. Now one thing I just mentioned <coughs> at the beginning as well about 350 pounds being light. 350 pounds sounds a lot in bow, in handheld bow terms. In crossbow terms, it's not, with a six inch power stroke, it's not particularly uh, powerful. It's certainly powerful enough to kill people and to hunt and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I have shot this bow and I will show this um, bow doing some, doing some things with this bow. I haven't yet quite decided exactly what I'm gonna do with it. I'm gonna film that over the next couple of days. Um, but um, it's not, 380 pounds is not as powerful as it might sound when it's coming out of a crossbow. And in fact, many historical crossbows go up to a thousand pounds draw weight and higher. And in fact, Todd can make and supply crossbows of that weight. Um, and now they have to be loaded, and this is where we talk about loading of these things, they have to be loaded pretty much always with either a windlass or a crankwin. Um, now a crankwin is essentially a cog on a ratchet. That's how I'd describe it. Um, and it has a long handle and you wind it like this and the cog works its way up the little teeth um, and gradually, gradually loads the thing. You, there's no physical way you could load a bow of that sort of power by hand, even with your foot in the stirrup. <coughs> um, the other form is a windlass and a windlass quite simply is a winch system. It's, it's a, a system of pulleys. Um, and there you have handles on either side and you wind it, obviously I can't do it both sides because I'm holding the, um, the bow at the moment, but you wind it both sides and uh, the, the strings essentially gradually draw that bow back. Now you'll notice because this is 380 pounds, even without putting my foot in the stirrup, if I just put the butt into my crotch, so to speak, I can physically start to pull that bow about two thirds of the way back. If I, if, I put my, um, if I put my foot into there and put both hands on the side of the string, I can almost um, string this by hand, but I would not recommend it because that is a swift way to give yourself a hernia. Now this type of bow is loaded with, because it's a lighter bow, with a quicker loading system that is known as a goat's foot lever. Now I'm gonna look at that in a minute, okay? So you've essentially got, in the medieval period, you've got four main types of crossbows, um, uh, loading methods for crossbows, and they relate to the weight or power of the bow. There are hand-spanned bows, okay, and they sometimes have a, if it's a really light bow, you don't even need a foot stirrup, you just literally pull the string down into the, into the, um, uh, into the trigger. Uh, locking mechanism there into the nut. Sorry, I was thinking, trying to think of the word into the nut. And so that you've got hand spanned ones, you've got um, goat's foot lever. Actually, there's five. I'll throw in another one in there. You've got goat's foot lever, which is this one. Then there's another form, which is essentially two hooks that attach to a belt. And in that form, you put your foot, you put the nose down, you put your foot into the stirrup on the ground you link up the two hooks on little ropes that attach to your belt and you stand up. So you're using the power of your legs to load it. And then you have the crankwin, which is the winding this way. And then you have the, the windlass um, loading, which is the winch that goes this way. So five main loading methods, hand, goat's foot, um, belt hooks, crankwin and windlass. Um, and this <coughs> is the goat's foot method. You could probably load this also with the um, hooks that attach to your belt and using the power of your legs, but, it, but the uh, goat's foot is a really nice, simple way of loading it. So looking at the bow, so it is a lovely thing. Um, Todd does make, um, he does make lovely things and his crossbows are gorgeous. Um, and they're the sort of thing that you could shoot for life and um, 
they would just keep going you know they're very sturdily built um, if we look at the um, I actually don't know the names of these bits but these um, kind of brackets I suppose or, or hoops that go around and hold the bow into the stock they're all incredibly you know you've got steel wedges in there it's a bit like certain types of 19th century revolver construction on Colts for example um, but you've got wedges on there holding everything tight and solid um, those can be removed if you need to remove the bow, if the bow was damaged or, for, or if the stock was damaged or whatever. The, um, th this is all forged, it's all hand forged. The um, foot stirrup, which has got a nice little bit of decoration on the end there, um, is beautifully, beautifully forged and really like absolutely solid. Um, you've got the trigger mechanism inside there, which is relatively simple. So what do we have? So if I pull the trigger up here, this is the trigger, just like on a gun. Okay, you'll notice if I hold it down, now that nut can turn around. Now I'm going to talk about, so when I pull that trigger, if the, there we go, get it into lock. There we go, so there's the locked position. So when we span the bow, when we draw the string back, it goes into that, oh, it's not locked, hold on. There we go, no, no, it's locked. It goes into that groove and the back end of the bolt, I'll talk a little bit about bolts in a bit, goes into there, okay? <clears throat> um, and when I pull the trigger, it releases that, that spins, releases the string and obviously shoots the bolt out. Just to show the back end of where that locks up, there we go, it's got a little metal reinforcement there. Now this nut is made of um, antler, I believe. Um, I'm not sure what kind of antler, I imagine from a fairly large deer, red deer or something. Um, and I asked Todd why they didn't, because I knew that they were made of um, antler, um, sometimes um, bone, I think. Why did they made it of that organic material? Why didn't they just make it of metal, for example? Um, and the answer seems to be um, that the lighter it is, the better. Because when I pull this trigger, that has to suddenly accelerate from zero meters per second to a lot of meters per second. Um, there we go with the physics again. Um, so quite simply, the lighter this is, the less inertia it will take to speed it, so, so the string will be released more quickly. Um, so you could make a metal one, you could make a metal nut, and it might be stronger, but this is strong enough to do the job, and a metal one would be very heavy and would reduce it would essentially suck some of the energy that should be going into this, it would suck some of the energy off into um, accelerating that fairly heavy, large nut. Um, these bolts at the side relate to the goat's foot lever, we'll look at those in a minute, and the mechanism that, it's a fairly simple mechanism, but the mechanism that um, f goes from the trigger to the nut is hidden behind this lock plate, which of course we see on early firearms as well. If I just grab a, because obviously I have them lying on, if I just grab an early pistol, that is a lock plate there. It's the same kind of thing. It's just hidden behind that plate. So if anything goes wrong with that mechanism, you just open that up and fix it. The stock, so you don't have a large butt, so to speak, like on a firearm, because there is no Recoil. There's no recoil this way, like with a firearm, because you've got no you've got no explosion going off inside. Instead, all you're doing is you're doing that and releasing a string. So, if anything, there's a very slight movement forwards when the string stops. There's no force backwards, so you don't have to pull it tight into your um, sort of shoulder like you do with a firearm. Uh, and I have, in fact, seen some people shooting these by laying them on top of the shoulder, so not actually into the shoulder at all, so that they can look more closely along the barrel, as it were. It's not the barrel, but the, the groove where the bolt goes along. Um, <clears throat> and obviously, if we're doing that, you're not going to be necessarily pulling the trigger in that way, like would be more natural for firearm users, but you might, in fact, be doing it with your thumb. And it really doesn't matter. So long as you're pointing it in the right direction, <laughs> then that's where the bolt's going to go. Now, let's have a little look at the projectile. So, unlike arrows, I'll just grab a longbow arrow. So, differences. This is a longbow arrow by Will Sherman. Um, reconstruction of a Mary Rose type arrow, lovely thing. And obviously a bolt is much, much shorter, okay? It should be relatively obvious why, um, but if your, if your um, bolt is only going in there, it doesn't need to be much longer than the bow. Okay? If it was, it would just keep falling off the end and it's superfluous length. 
Okay, generally speaking, with any type of bow, you want the projectile to be just long enough that it needs to be and not too much more because anything extra is just wasted okay um, the width now it's interesting a lot of people will go oh well you know a crossbow bolt is much thicker than an arrow a medieval crossbow bolt actually it's not that much thicker it doesn't need to be um, these shoot happily out of a 380 or 400 pound um, draw weight crossbow and in fact you could shoot these out of a heavier bow although preferably you probably use thicker pearls or bolts for that um, but you'll notice the actual Mary Rose arrow is actually not much thinner than the um, than the crossbow quarrel or bolt. And there's a very good reason for that. Because there's a remarkably similar amount of energy going into both of them. Okay. Now, while this is 380 pounds, remember that's a six inch power stroke. With a longbow, you might have 120 pounds. Um, so, you know, like a third, a third of the, of the poundage but you're drawing it back far, far further. The power stroke's far longer. So the amount of energy is the, the power of the bow times the length of the power stroke, more or less. So um, in actual fact, because the arrow's got so much more of a power stroke, um, even with a lighter bow, the longbow ends up actually storing as, much, as many joules of energy in this as you get into the crossbow bolt from this. Right, let's put the arrow down. <coughs> so, um, so the bolt is shorter than an arrow, of course. Um, it also can have, not always, but it can have a different type of head to the um, arrow. This is a type that is fairly commonly found archaeologically and associated usually with crossbows more than longbows. And it's quite a, it's quite a heavy, quite a beefy, heavy head. Um, and it's designed, it seems to be designed with penetration of um, hard materials in mind. It's not like a hunting arrowhead, it's not something that's optimised for causing maximum um, flesh damage or bleeding, you know, like a broadhead or it's not barbed or anything like this. It seems to be designed with penetrating resistive materials in mind. Now you can make of that what you will. Uh, the jury's out. Were these, were these designed to be shot through plate armour? Nah. I think what they were thinking were they're probably going to hit plate armor, so you may as well do as much damage as possible. Um, uh, you know, I think they will happily go through mail, they will happily go through uh, um, gambesons most of the time, um, and you know, maybe sometimes they might get their way through thinner plates. We do actually know, much like bulletproof, which was testing a breastplate with a pistol in the 17th century, we do know in fact that earlier on in the 15th and 16th centuries that some breastplates were tested with crossbows. So it certainly was seen, on continental Europe at least, maybe in Germany and Italy, that crossbows were the kind of benchmark for what your armour should be able to resist if it was good quality armour. But remember, not everything is a breastplate and not everything is the best quality armour. Some bits of armour are much thinner, some bits on other people might not be so, so good quality. Um, an interesting feature that differs from an arrow with a crossbow bolt or quarrel is there's no knock for the string at the back. It just sits up, it just butts up against the string. It doesn't lock onto the string like an arrow does. And the fletchings, as I would normally call them as a, as a longbow archer, are, I don't actually know if they have a specific name for crossbow bolts, are wood in this case. I think that some of them for crossbows were made of parchment or um, leather, perhaps. Um, but wood seemed to be quite common, uh, and certainly Todd makes most of his of wood. And interestingly, if you look along them, you'll see Todd has angled them, amazing bit of craftsmanship there, so he's put a curved line into the bolt such that when you shoot it the bolt will actually spin, which of course aids accuracy just like rifling, just like spinning a bullet in the rifling of a, of a, of a rifle or any rifled firearm. Um, so there we go, there's the bolt, actually relatively uninteresting and that's about as much as I can say about it. Usually the shafts would be made of a similar type of wood to arrows, so probably something like poplar or ash, this kind of thing. Right, now back to the crossbow. So what we're going to do um, uh, is, uh, there's going to be another video following this because otherwise it'll be too long, um, but I'm just going to quickly look over some of the decorative features of this particular bow and then in the next video we're going to look at loading it. Right, so um, first of all the butt plate, we've got a lovely bit of um, horn there, looks like um, dark cow horn I would say. Then along the side of the stock we've got this really nice um, inset a uh, bit of, or inlay rather, of um, bone and cow horn. And that is 
really really nice and um, with the black and white so the horn obviously everyone knows that the cow horn is <laughs> it's got various colors in it but if you want to have something black and white direction um black and white uh, coloured, you specifically have to pick the bits of horn that are black, obviously, um, or find a horn that's entirely black. Anyway, so um, Todd has cut out the horn and the bone, the white bone is in the centre line there. We've already talked about the nut. Um, here we've got an inlay that I believe, in fact I'm pretty sure is bone, um, which on either side has a decorative line, again, of horns. So we've got this black and white direction, um, black and white kind of contrast. Uh, it's very very attractive. The steel bow itself, as I mentioned, has been covered with, I believe, what's linen or some other type of fabric. That, of course, has the benefit of protecting the bow from rust, which is, generally speaking, a good idea. Um, also reduces upkeep, um, re reduces maintenance, potentially, and it's been nicely painted uh, on front. You've got to remember that in the medieval period and Renaissance, lots of surfaces would have been painted. Statues, churches, all loads of stuff was painted. And um, we think of you know Gothic architecture now as all looking grey, um, or even you know or white or black, kind of monochrome. But it wasn't at all originally. It was all painted and bright and vibrant. Um, so you've got to think about this side. The um, string, I can't remember, I believe it's a linen string if I remember correctly. I did ask Todd that, but I can't remember what his answer was. Um, I believe it's a linen string and it's bound and bound and bound. You know, it's very heavily, it's like a piece of rope essentially, because it has to be, it has to be very strong. It's held under constant pressure and the central, what we would call serving with a, um, with a longbow for example, is uh, sort of reinforced in the centre section and it's all covered in beeswax which of course protects it from the rain and we all know the story whether it's true or not um, I believe at uh, Agincourt where the crossbows didn't perform very well because they got wet and were not powerful enough I'll actually talk a little bit more about power and, and penetration and things like that um, <clears throat> so there we go there's an overview of one of Todd's absolutely wonderful crossbows this actual crossbow is <laughs> is for sale right now I'm not trying to do a hard sell or anything um, but just saying it is not mine it is going back to Todd imminently um, and it's on his it's linked below um, oh and final thing Thing, the trigger which I think is really really attractive um, so really nicely shaped but then with this extra filed um, decoration in there very much um, consistent with the aesthetic of the period but there we go crossbows a little introduction um, and hopefully maybe something interesting was said during that video and there will be another video coming um, very soon where I will load and talk a little bit more about this beast cheers folks Thank you for watching, please subscribe, follow us on Facebook, you can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.